Hi, I'm Dennis Metzler and welcome to The Charge. Today we are looking at the Gospel of Luke. We are with Dr. Nicholas Perrin, who is a biblical scholar and the president of Trinity International University in Deerfield, Illinois. He's the author of the book, the volume on Luke, which is in the Tyndale New Testament commentary series. So, Dr. Perrin, thank you so much for joining us today. Dennis, thanks for having me on the show. All righty. So, before we dive into Luke, just to give the audience an idea of where you're coming from, if you just say a little about your theological and your church background. Sure. I'm, I am in the Free Church, the EFCA, and originally before this denominational stripe, I was in the Presbyterian Church in America. So, soteriologically, I'm Reformed. Um, in, in terms of my eschatology, I'm premillennial, um, but in which I think gives me a certain kind of earthiness in how I think about the kingdom. Um, and I think those are probably the, the most important contours as far as interpreting Luke goes. All right. So, um, why another commentary on Luke? What, um, what are you, what's your basic, uh, what are you trying to get at? What is important for you in, in your approach? You know, it's when, when people ask that question about why another commentary, on one level I get it because sometimes you're reading commentaries and you say, wow, this sounds exactly like what I read in the last commentary. Um, but I, you know, Dennis, in my experience, God's word is so deep and so rich. We're always finding new things and new treasures. So there's always new insights to be garnered. And I think that is going to continue to be the case uh, un until he returns. But I think in terms of my distinctive approach, uh, I, I really am a firm believer in the principle of Scripture, interpreting Scripture. And I think that in some ways in the, uh, in the modern period, in the post-Enlightenment period, we're a little bit burdened by an epistemic approach or a theory of language or hermeneutic, which tends to uh, abstract meaning uh, on a kind of very isolated, in a very isolated context, maybe on a word by word basis, maybe in a paragraph basis. Uh, but if Luke is writing his gospel as scripture, which I'm pretty convinced he was, then he expects the same hermeneutical rules that were current in the first century uh, world of Judaism to apply in reading Luke. So what that means is, number one, taking co-text very seriously. And what I mean by co-text as opposed to context is when we, it's just very important to, to follow Luke along and to follow repeated usages of words or phrases or ideas and always be comparing a, a given passage or pericope with what has gone before, especially looking for similarities, letting scripture interpret scripture. To some extent, New Testament scholars are already doing that. I don't think we're doing that enough. Uh, narrative criticism has made some real inroads. I think we need to I think narrative criticism is actually unearthed insights that are more true to how Luke sees the text. I think the second thing that's important is the Old Testament story. I think, by and large, most biblical commentators tend to underestimate the the importance of Old Testament vocabulary and concepts and backstory in understanding the New Testament texts. Um, some people might call me a maximalist, um, so be it, but in, in terms of finding correspondences between Old Testament uh, concepts and motifs and terminology. But I really believe that Luke not only expected his gospel to be read within the context of itself, but within the context of the scriptures that had gone before, um, his audience would have been very well versed in the scriptures and would have been had their ears attuned to to echoes and nuances that were that were scriptural. All right, and then what can you say about um, the purpose, Luke's purpose in writing the gospel and the audience that he's writing to? Yeah, you know, a lot's been written about different ideas about why Luke wrote his gospel. Some have argued that Luke is um, advocating kind of pro-Roman stance, and others, ironically, are arguing that that Luke is actually an anti-imperial uh, script. Uh, I do think Luke is interested in engaging with Rome and the imperium and Roman ideology. Um, there is a, there's some kind of balance or, or paradoxical balance I think he strikes that makes either of those judgments difficult. Um, there's, I mean, there is a lot going on. I think one of the questions has to do with what order Luke was written in. Uh, 
I am pretty safe with or pretty comfortable thinking that Luke is at least the third. He might have been the last gospel written, um, but uh, toward the later end. So there were other gospels. I think what Luke really wanted to do very intentionally in pairing Luke with Acts is to kind of give a charter document for here's our founding history. Every movement needs founding stories and a way of understanding self-identity within its founding. I think Luke is very intentional about providing the first church history, uh, which is also a salvation history. All right, and his audience? Yeah, that's tricky. I mean, it's the, the question as to who the gospel is written for has been a, a on and off question for at least a good 20 years. And I, my sense is that, again, um, I think that Luke is writing his gospel as a kind of scripture, which he expected to be read uh, throughout the, the networks of churches scattered around the Mediterranean world and wherever the church would expand. So he's writing for the everyday Christian out there somewhere. Uh, he's got great Greek. It's probably the best Greek in the New Testament or as good as Greek as any other writer. So that might appeal to a certain a style or sensibility, maybe upper class or the more well-educated. But I do think that he's expecting uh, his gospel to be read uh, where Christians gather. And what can you say about the social historical situation that Luke is writing into? Um, not his, but the, where he situates Jesus. Yeah, so if, uh, I'm, I'm under the assumption that Luke is writing about a generation after the time of Jesus. And obviously has access to witnesses and people who ran into Jesus and other people who ran into people who ran into Jesus. Uh, he says as much, and he's very self-conscious as a historian in the prologue, the first four verses of chapter one. So he he's trying to uncover the past, or at least preserve the past with, using access to contemporary witnesses. Um, same thing in the book of Acts. I think the, here are the main things that are going on in Jesus's Palestine. Um, on a p geopolitical level, Rome's in control. And what the Jews keenly felt more than anything else was the indignity of having a pagan force run the, the, run the ship when they were supposed to be the special people of God. Um, they were living under the covenantal curses. Uh, the, for me, the bottom line of the covenantal curses is when the Gentiles are running your show, it means you're experiencing the curses. And Judaism had been laboring under that. Um, so that's the political situation. In terms of economic situation, first century Palestine was a highly stratified society. This is also true socially. Um, but there were the extreme, uh, extremely wealthy and then the extreme poor and a lot of other poor. So um, in terms of the bottom 90% of earners, they're probably all together um, toward the poor side, uh, which creates a, which makes money an issue, makes resources an issue, an important talking point, which it is in Luke. I, I'd say in terms of socially, that, that's again, very hierarchical, very stratified society. Um, Jesus, uh, Luke's Jesus challenges that on a number of levels. So that too is an important background. And you already uh, mentioned this briefly, but what does Luke do with the Old Testament? Yeah, I mean, Luke goes to town with the Old Testament. And, and this is also true with the other gospel writers, as far as I can see. But let, let me give you a few instances of, of how he handles that. Um, Luke's very fond, fond of typology, and he's concerned to present Jesus as the fulfillment of salvation history. Uh, partially, we know this because of the, what Jesus says on the road to Emmaus, that all the scriptures have been pointing up to this moment. And J Jesus came in order to fulfill all the scriptures. And we already see that hinted when Jesus at so many points is compared uh, to different Old Testament figures, to Moses, um, to Elijah and Elisha, and which is different from the other Gospels. And so there's a kind of typology. It's not just being cute. It's a way of saying that what those figures represented and the things that they were up to under God's um, leading have become perfected in Jesus. So Jesus is the perfect Elijah. He is the perfect Elisha. 
Um, he is the perfect Moses. He's also the perfect Adam. And those are all key pieces, and we can say more, David, etc. So this all keys in on Luke's concept of or theme of fulfillment. I think the other thing that's that's really interesting is how Luke sets the stage in, in so many ways for where as you're walking through the gospel and making your way through, you discover little hints and clues and then get a fuller elaboration. And you, you might even call that foreshadowing. So to give you a, an analogy, you know, sometimes you're watching a movie and a prop comes up or scene happens and you know that what, what the director is doing is leaving you a clue, like latch on to this little piece of evidence because you're going to need it later on or it's going to make sense. You know, the revolver the camera, cl- you know, has a close up on a revolver on a desk. OK, well, that you know, that's going to come up later. So Luke's doing that all the time. Um, and one example, I haven't seen anyone write about this, but one thing I point out in my commentary is it's interesting how many times Jesus's feet come up in the gospel. Uh, mm. When the when the sinful woman comes in, she's washing Jesus's feet. When the demoniac uh, has a legion of demons cast out of him, where where does he end up? At, at Jesus's feet. Martha and Mary, um, Mary is sitting where? At Jesus's feet. So you see this kind of repetition of Jesus's feet. And in all three of those instances, Jesus's feet is a pretty good place to be. Like you, you want to be at Jesus's feet. And eventually that comes full cir- circle in the resurrection appearance where there seems to be an allusion to that text in Isaiah, which says, how lovely are the, the, are the feet of him who bring good news. Mm-hmm. So Jesus is the bringer of goodness. So you say, ah, that's what that's all going toward. It's, it's pointing ahead to um, Jesus as that figure. So we have very extended birth narrative, both of Jesus and John. We've got all sorts of characters included, the parents of each of them, and then Anna and Simeon. Uh, so, and plus we have two gospels that don't say a word about Jesus' right. birth. So what um, are we to understand theologically from all this? Yeah, that, that, that is a great question and an interesting question. I think there are a couple of things going on here. One is, you know, Mark, Mark is just like right in, when Jesus starts his ministry, boom, you're off to the races. Matthew has... Uh, uh, you know, the, the events right around Jesus' birth, including the trip to Egypt and then back. But then you fast forward um, to Jesus' later years. Luke is more concerned about Jesus' youth than anybody else. And I think part of that, I have to believe that there might be a kind of interest in giving Jesus the more human side of Jesus. If there were docetic tendencies, in other words, if there's tendencies to say, well, Jesus was like this ghost that kind of just showed up. Uh, who looked like a 30-year-old, but he wasn't really human, then certainly giving a little background on Jesus' youth, that he, he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. He, he, you know, in other words, he grew up just like we did. Um, so there might be an agenda just to make sure that his readers were fully incarnational in, in how they thought about Christ. I think, secondly, um, Luke's conforming his biography. There's elements in which the, each gospel is a biography. And a Greek bios would have had elements where you get the youth of the hero and Luke's conforming to that. And I think he's trying to meet the expectations of his Roman readers who would have been familiar with that genre. I think I think finally, you think, I mean, a lot of business with John the Baptist. And what we do know is in the second century, there was a kind of ongoing John the Baptist cult. Uh, that venerated John the Baptist and maybe venerated John the Baptist more than Jesus was venerated. And for all we know, what Luke is doing is trying to lay that to rest by saying, look, John was great. Uh, Among women, there's no one greater than John. True. At the same time, there's this kind of step-by-step progression in the first two chapters of Luke where John is John and uh, Jesus are being compared all the time and and John is here and Jesus is a next level up and I think uh, he's trying to not just get people's Christology straight but people's uh, John the Baptistology straight too okay how about the prophetic utterances though we have it from Mary and from Zechariah Anna and Simeon I believe all have prophetic utterances yeah, I had a student um, who pub- who's got a, f- 
just published his dissertation on this, Caleb Friedman, and I'm, and I'm going to refer every um, one to that because part of what he's arguing, or a good bit of what he's arguing, is those prophetic utterances are filling out a, a, a Christology and, and have a kind of a witnessing impact to Christology. I think that... I, I think that is definitely going on. I, fi I find that uh, uh, Caleb's Friedman's argument is is convincing. Um, but I think what's also happening in those opening chapters is John is setting the stage for what the rest of the gospel is going to fill out. So we see, you know, in, in Magnificat, for example, she's talking about the strong arm of the Lord, which is an Exodus image. And you have the theme of Exodus in Luke and in Acts. Um, you have, you know, Zechariah um, meeting Gabriel. Well, who's the last figure to meet Gabriel? And that's Daniel. Um, and Daniel prophesied the end of exile. And lots of other images that seem to tie in um, Luke chapter 1 and parts of chapter 2 with Daniel 7 through 11, as if to say that which Daniel was talking about, Jesus is now going to bring to a close. Um, and then that cues up the reader to look for that as the narrative unfolds. All right. And so big theme for Luke is the kingdom of God. Yeah. And so um, if you could um, talk about the kingdom of God, especially in contrast to uh, the Jewish leaders' understanding of uh, in relation to that, and also the Roman political leaders. Yeah, that's, and that's a great question. I think that in order to understand what Luke is trying to do, and even what the other gospel writers are trying to do, it's, it's more along the lines of the same thing. They are setting up a narrative or a story or an account of reality that is deeply at odds on the one hand with reality as prescribed by Judaism of the day, official Judaism of the day, although that was very diverse. Um, and on the other hand, by the Roman Imperium, which was more monolithic, um, but also had its own narrative. Now, what I mean by narrative is every society has its narrative, its own a story by which it understands itself. Uh, you know, what's going on in the United States today is actually, you know, with all the polarization, uh, what's really going on is, is two, largely two competing narratives and variations of that narrative. Um, at odds with each other, and um, the, the narr each narrative deals with questions of who are we, where do we come from, where are we going, what's uh, most important, what's what's powerful, what's meaningful, what's true. These are all really fundamental questions, and Rome had all those questions answered ahead of time, and they would remind you of answers to those questions. And when you get those messages enough, um, you get an you know, you're, you're seeping in the Roman way. But Judaism had the same thing, where it had its own understanding. So on the to come back to your question about the kingdom, for Rome, um, Caesar Augustus was understood to be the Pontifex, Pontifex Maximus. So he was the high priest of the whole Roman Empire. And the well-being of the Roman Empire depended on Caesar to appease the gods and to function as a high priest. And to bring soteria, salvation, uh, to the nations and well-being and peace. Uh, key words that Luke picks up on in the birth narrative in Luke 2, as if to challenge that, that Roman script. Uh, for the Jews, uh, the, the, though, there again, there was lots of variation within Judaism uh, and different sects that spun out, spun out of Judaism at the time. What you have is a script that goes something like this. Um, we have broken the covenant, but by following through on the right type of piety, we will be able to get God's attention. He will come back, deliver us. God will raise up the Messiah to beat the tar out of the Gentiles, get them out of the temple. And the temple, I believe, is the central uh, thing for Jews. It wasn't necessary. It was political autonomy, but that was secondary to cultic purity. Um, and you need the political autonomy to secure the, the cultic purity. What, what every pious Jew was really after at the end of the day was get the temple right. And when you get the temple right and worship God right, everything else takes care of itself. Uh, that kingdom come. The Jews had their own formula for doing that, and that was through the Torah piety. And Jesus comes and challenges both. 
Okay, and then as far as Jesus' understanding of the kingdom according to Luke, what could, more could you say? Yeah, I mean, what's what's really interesting about Jesus and the kingdom is he never gives a clear cut. Okay, you guys, you, you want to know what the kingdom is? Here it is. I'll tell you in one sentence or one paragraph. Instead, he talks about the kingdom indirectly through parables, giving the indication that the kingdom is something that's so mysterious that normal propositional language isn't able to capture it. But we can use propositional language or, or poetic images or things like parables to get at it and to get at certain truths of the kingdom. So um, and, and that has made the kingdom very difficult to talk about. Um, in, and I wrote a, a book about the kingdom for Zondervan, and I just said, wow, I just feel like I just you know, picked away at the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more that can be said and needs to be said. So you can talk around the kingdom. But what, some of the key features of the kingdom that would have been surprising to the Jews of the day is that the, the kingdom was an already but not yet reality. Not all Judaism. I mean, we have some indications in Enochic Judaism that there was some concept of an already not yet. But most Jews would have said that when the kingdom gets here, we're going to know it. And it's going to be pretty strong and marked break uh, with the the dark, you know, the, the darkness of this age to this new reality. And Jesus instead is is having these two kingdoms um, live together simultaneously in a, a kind of parasitic relationship, um, and that was that would have been new and different and shocking. Um, that it would, that it came in the present and it came through Jesus would have at least this catches the Jewish leaders off guard, and they don't like Jesus on both those claims. So um, they they prefer to see the kingdom coming in on their terms within their infrastructure that they were preserving. And Jesus upsets that by saying, no, the kingdom is here now, and it's available in me. So how about the gospel? Um, for so many Christians, we want to jump straight to Paul and talk about the death of Jesus for all sinners, his burial, his resurrection. Right. But Jesus seems to talk about the good news in terms of the coming of the kingdom. So um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that that's a great question that I think every thinking Christians should wrestle through. I think what we have to be careful here is not to make a category mistake between the concept and language. So I think kingdom language is very much, or kingdom concepts are very much vital to Paul's theology. Uh, he prefers phraseology like in Christ or in the Messiah or in the King. So our position in Christ means that we're already in some sense in the kingdom. If you know, you get some of that in the Gospel of John, but um, Jesus is already anticipating the resurrection at that point in the Gospel of John. But in the Synoptic Gospels, he comes from a different angle that would make sense to people who are alive in the day. So he's 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 talking about this this new reality, um, and he picks up themes that Paul doesn't necessarily pick up. But on the other hand. Paul knew that at least, uh, even Paul writes before the Gospels were written, he knew that there were the oral traditions floating around that talked about the kingdom. And so he tries to fill in things uh, a little bit differently. He doesn't need to talk about uh, the upside down nature of the kingdom directly. Although, you know, you look at Corinthians, um, it, it's a, Paul's operating by an upside down kingdom economy. Okay. So um, we touched on this already, but Jesus' relationship to uh, the Jewish religious system, so the law, the temple, the Sabbath, right. and the religious leader, leaders that he found himself in opposition to. Yeah. Wow. There's, what, there's a lot there. Oh, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. So here's, here's what I think is going on, is when Jesus appears on the scene, he he is making some claims and everyone's trying to figure out what he's getting at. Uh, but in, if we go to Luke chapter four, we find his inaugural sermon, which he gives in his hometown. And he quotes Isaiah 61, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Um, that text was typically understand in messianic terms. Um, but Jesus is also claiming to have the unique unction of the spirit to announce 
the Jubilee, uh, which on one level was supposed to be announced every 50 years as a remission of debts. But everyone was looking forward to the Grand Jubilee that was going to be at the, you know, at the 490 year mark. And Jesus is, is basically saying that, that time is here and now. And it's um, and with that kind of remission or freedom, uh, we begin to discover as Luke unfolds that he is issuing a new law. And then by the time we get to the Last Supper, he talks about a new covenant. So to get to a real bottom line, fundamental bottom line, the, the key significance of Jesus isn't that he said, oh, that Jewish law is no good. It's too legalistic. A lot of Christians will, will say, you know, pick on Judaism and, and the law. And, and Jesus was about tolerance and about you know, not being such a legalist, <laughs> such a misreading of what's going on. Uh, G, you know, Jesus was a pious Jew, but he's introducing a new covenant, and covenant is the ba most basic fundamental framework because covenant get, includes a law, uh, but also includes a temple space. Each covenant had its own prescription, and law and temple always work collaterally. Uh, each covenantal system, whether you're thinking about um, Abraham or Moses or, or David has its own, you know, MO for how God would worship the people and what kind of prescriptions they needed to live by. Jesus is introducing a whole new MO by introducing uh, a new covenant. So therefore, it, it builds on the law, um, but it's it's also a renewal of the law and going in a new direction. But it also uh, implies new uh, holy space, and Jesus constitutes that new holy space. All right, then. And so because of that, he's got a different vision of what it means to fulfill the law and what the temple was all about. So what's really going on then between the, with the conflict with the leaders who want to maintain that? In, in other words, what's for them the real rubbing point? For them. Right. Are, are, are they just afraid of losing power or do they really see Jesus as a threat to um, the survival of Israel um, because he's going to lead the people in the wrong direction? You know, I think there's a little bit of both going on because I think the Jewish leaders really thought that if the people stuck with, you know, people just stick with us, God's going to finally sit up and take notice and the Messiah will come and everything will be good. Um, I think the Jewish leaders really thought that they had the keys to the kingdom. And um, Jesus is saying, uh, you know, au contraire. I, so th this works out in a couple of ways. So I'll, let me give you an example. You remember that when Jesus is in, in the grain field with the disciples and they come by and they, they criticize Jesus um, because, look, your disciples are, you know, husking grain. They take, you know, rubbing grain in their hands on the Sabbath. And that's forbidden on the Sabbath. And then. Jesus goes seems to go out on a tangent where he's talking about, well, haven't you read about David in the days of Abiathar um, and how, you know, he ate on the Sabbath and um, and those with him. And, you know, you say, well, what's the point of all that? My argument and my commentary uh, is that actually what's going on here is Jesus is comparing himself with David. Why? Because David had. Uh, a priestly mantle. He wore the ephod, which means his function as a priest. Uh, David and Solomon were you were standalone kings in the line of Israel's kings who could actually serve as priests. But uh, we know that they both served as priests. Um, there wasn't a division between the priestly role and the royal role that would characterize the rest of the kingdom. Um, Jesus is returning Israel to a uniting of the priestly and royal roles. I think personally that has to do with um, the integration of the 12 tribes. In other words, there's some kind of connection, and one I, I confess I don't fully understand, between the disintegration of the 12 tribes that happens with uh, Solomon's successors and the dissolution of those two offices. Um, we get a hint of that with Hezekiah, too, by the way, when he brings the tribes together for a Passover. So all, all to say what, what's going on is to come back to the Greenfield incident, he is saying when when David ate the Abiathar's showbread, he had full right to that because he was a priest. My guys and I can do can eat bread on the Sabbath or do work on the Sabbath because we are priests. And every first century Jew would have known that yes, for for priests, Sabbath is your work day, and you're always at 
work on that day. Like, you know, like, like today's pastors who have to figure out now where's, when's my day off. Well, it ain't Sunday. And so same, same principle. Jesus is implying that he's, that he's introducing a new priesthood and his guys are fellow priests with him. And that's deeply threatening. If you, if you make your living as a priest um, and, you know, someone else is introducing a whole new system. Um, and, and think about, you know, same thing with John the Baptist. He's, you know, the, the leaders come to him and he calls them a brood of vipers. In other words, you know, like John's just not having a bad hair day. He's saying, look, you're on the outside of the covenant. And here I am at the Jordan. Why the Jordan? Um, because I'm baptizing and um, and the Jordan is significant because when Israel crossed the Jordan, that's when they entered the promised land. Uh, John, John is saying, I'm rebooting Israel and you and. The nation is so corrupt and the covenant is so broken. I have to treat you like Gentiles um, because that's how Gentiles came into Judah or Israel is um, through baptism. Now, there's a question as to whether it was that early, certainly by 30 or 40 years later. But I think that that's exactly what he's saying. He's, ask, he's asking is, Israel to reconvert to this new system. The covenant has been broken. It's time for something new. That was deeply threatening to the leadership. All right, so another major theme in Luke is hospitality to the other, yeah. to the marginalized, to the poor, women, children, Gentiles. Um, how does that tie in theologically in terms of Jesus fulfilling his messianic role? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and Luke pays m much more attention to this than the other gospel writers. Um, I think, you know, what's, what's interesting about the hospitality motif is that again and again you just you see jesus play host but he also plays guests at the same time so he's having he's having like, let's for example um when he comes to somebody's house and um the, the sinful woman comes in and the, his host uh did not actually perform the roles of his the host she comes in and Jesus starts playing role of host to her. He receives her. He's hosting her even while he's guest. To give you another example, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, you, you remember the story. This a man is going down by the side of the road. He gets beaten up, left half dead. Um, a Good Samaritan comes in, plays the role of the host, takes him to, you know, the hotel and says, look, here's my credit card, take care of them, you know, whatever's left over, I'll, I'll pay it back. So the ultimate host, um, Jesus is saying, so be the ultimate host. But what's, what's interesting too, is when Jesus describes the state of the guy, the man who's going down and, and beaten up, a lot of the verbs are the same verbs that Luke uses during Jesus's passion. Um, and which would suggest to me, that Jesus is actually represented by two figures. He is not only um, the Good Samaritan, but he's the man in the ditch. He's not just the host, but he's the one who needs to be hosted. And you you kind of see this duality again and again. And I, I think what's what's neat about that is it forces us to say, you know, there's, there's times when uh, we really have to um, take risks and invest in hosting people. And uh, and Luke is encouraging us, you know, to pay it forward by thinking about the resurrection. Use money, your resources to buy friends for yourselves, because when it's gone, you'll be you get paid back, um, just like the owner of the hotel was paid back um, in, in Parable of the Good Samaritan. So we need to take those risks. Why? Because we are resurrection people. And if we are generous with our resources, God is going to make that good on the other side. But at the same time, there's there's times when we need to be the recipients and we need to receive what other people have. So um, it's uh, if, if we were to live that out as a church, what that would mean is not taking a patronizing approach where we're always in control and we're always doing the serving, uh, because there's sometimes that, you know, we need to be the ones who are served and we need pe people to serve us. And it's a reciprocity uh, between the church. A healthy church sees a little bit of both going on. I think the last thing I want to say about hospitality, I think is important, is that in the first century world, hospitality, it was at the, around the table 
where social lines were drawn. And again, first century world is very socially stratified. When you came to a formal dinner, your places were pretty much set for you according to where you were in the pecking order. Um, Jesus messes with all that because what he's saying is, you know, next time you have a luncheon or dinner, don't invite your friends, but just, you know, invite the blind, the lame, the crippled. And these were people who had been very marginalized, very low on the social pecking order. And he says, you know, put them at your right side. And what that does is that messes with the whole hierarchy, breaks down the whole hierarchy. But it, what it also does is it gives them um, social capital. And I think one thing Christians really need to spend more time thinking about, especially as we talk about issues of race, is how do majority cultures, how can majority cultures do a better job? Um, which, you know, we talk a lot about sharing material resources, which is an interesting discussion. But what about sharing social capital? And uh, what are ways, you know, networks that people in majority culture have that sometimes people in minority culture don't have access to the same networks that get them the jobs, that get them that place, that get them that income. Um, and when what happens is when you're locked into your own little silos, it perpetuates a caste system. And Jesus is saying, break down the caste system through being generous, not just with your resources and sharing food, but share your social capital. All right. Yeah, we could go a long ways with that. The, um, the liberation theologians certainly have a lot to say about all those sort of um, issues. But um, so related to that, we have the Sermon on the Plain, and I'm particularly zeroing in on Jesus' command to love our enemies. Um, how does this relate to the law? What is distinct in Jesus' command here? And how does it, what are the social ethical in implications? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, when you think about the Sermon on the Plain, um, it's something, you get it fairly early in the gospel, and then you just watch Jesus live it out again and again. So, you know, he, he's forgiving people from the cross, and he's he's loving his enemies. So Jesus doesn't ask us to live up to a standard he hasn't already modeled. Um, I think part of what's going on here with the command to, to love your enemies is, look, here, here are the Christians. I believe that by the time Luke was written, the Christians were already being seriously persecuted. Um, Jesus talks a lot about persecution in the Sermon on the Plain. And the, the question they must have been wrestling with is, well, what do we respond? How do we respond? Do we get our, you know, our guns out and start shooting? Do we run away? And Jesus' response is pretty shocking. He's like, he's, well, let's, let's start with loving people and loving those who persecute you and um, see that as opportunities. And that's so counterintuitive. So the, the love command is really a command made for people who are in the midst of persecution and who uh, might be losing their property, might be being sent to prince, prison or to their death sentence. And that that is truly radical. But um, I think that's an important context. And especially as um, the you know, the church is now more persecuted than ever globally. And some might argue that in the United States, um, there is a softer form of persecution. But per persecution is, is a reality right here. Uh, and it's so we need to really appropriate this theology of persecution much more seriously. OK, and so all the way through, we have uh, the disciples, Jesus doing his acts. Um, but tr calling the disciples, training them, um, sending them out. So what's important here and how does this relate to the church? Um, do we see the, the disciples, the collection of disciples as representing the church or this is just a, a mission group on the side or what? Yeah, I think, I think what, you know, so you have the sending out of the 12 um, in Luke 9 and then the sending out of 72 in, in Luke 10. Um, and Luke, more so than any of the other gospel writers, is paying attention to this kind of training session. I think there's a few things going on here. Number one is Jesus is enacting parables through the disciples. So he tells them, you know, go ahead, hit the road. Um, don't pack food. You know, don't take money. Um, 
live on the land. And and when you think about it, that's pretty much how the Sinai wilderness generation would have lived and was called to live, actually. You know, with the manna, you couldn't pack away manna for overnight. It would go stale, grow worms. So you just kind of lived off the land, literally. Um, and that was the Exodus way of life. Jesus, in sending out the 12, is asking them to enact an Exodus way of life. And also by getting by asking them to come to cities and having people take them in he's identifying that became a kind of a way of identifying who the who god's working in where this where the spirit is resting on so this 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 theme of hospitality also shows who's um who we're really going to focus in on i think that a number of those issues become paradigmatic for acts and what what jesus does in that dry initial run we see in the early chapters of acts the church doing the same thing moving out from the cities and um going forward all right and then we have the uh hard discipleship sayings um hate your family hate your own life um, take up your cross renounce your possessions so what do we do with that? Is that just stretching us or is this calling us to a, a whole different way of living? Yeah, I think, well, I think it's stretching us and calling us a whole different way of living. Just to put in the first century context, me, okay, so think about Jesus' very hard sayings about, you know, hating members of your own family. And what's, you know, what's he getting at there? In the first century world, your family was everything. It was your tribe. It was your, you, you know, you would do everything for your family. And there, there's certain cultures um, where that's modern cultures where that's true today. And it all stops with the family. Like the family, what's best for the family becomes a kind of moral norm for all like ethical reasoning. Jesus is challenging that. He's saying, look, you know, as important as your family is, um, I need to be more important. The kingdom needs to be more important. Uh, so that would have been very radical in the day. And, um, you know, then in the eschatological discourse in Luke 20, when he talks about, you know, your own relatives handing you over, um, I mean, gosh, I mean, this is hardball. And uh, Jesus is just putting it, you know, this is the way it's going to be. And if that's really the case, then what that also implies is that Jesus is reconstituting a new family around himself. So biological family matters, and it's a framework for how we go through life. But there's a more important framework, and that's the people of God. So that's that's number one. I, you know, the other hard sayings about uh, dying to self um, and carrying the cross. Uh, I mean, we have to work through that every day, and and especially, you know, carrying the cross. I think the the symbol of the cross, what it means more than anything else, is is shame. Um, when you're carrying the cross, you're basically announcing to all the people lying in the streets that um, you're a shameful person who deserves to be crucified. And Jesus had to go through all that. And um, sh shame is um, different cultures respond to shame differently. But it was a first century world was a shame culture. And the worst thing, worst thing, far worse than just dying was dying a shameful death. And um, what the gospel calls us to is to live a life of shame by associating with Jesus. Uh, what I think one of our challenges in the Western church anyway is too many Christians are unwilling to bear the shame of the gospel. And want they want their Jesus, but they want it without the shame. That's a problem, Jesus says. And st the other hard sayings have to do with uh, resources. Uh, Luke is more interested in stewardship, the issue of stewardship than any other gospel writer. Um, I think stewardship, when we talk about stewardship, we, we're always talking about money. But when you think about it, Dennis, like every area of our life is an area of stewardship. So no matter, whatever we have responsibility for. So I talked about social capital already. But, you know, there's also political capital. And, you know, when people talk about voting and, and national elections or local elections, um, that's ours to steward. And so the question is, you know, we have a vote. How do you steward that vote um, effectively? Um, I think that's that's where kingdom thinking comes in. And if, in some situations, we're going to have much to steward and other situations will less steward. But the rule is whatever God has given you to steward, 
steward it well, thinking your thoughts after him. All right, so um, we've got uh, some thorny eschatological passages here where it seems confused. Um, are you, is Luke talking about the actual second coming of Christ, or is he talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, or he assumes they both happened together and then he was wrong? Or what is going on here? All right, so in Luke 21, with that. I'll yeah, 17, 19, and especially 21. Yeah, so with the parable of the ten minas, the way it might take on the parable of the ten minas, is he, it's a parable about a king whose subjects hated him. And then he goes away and uh, he, he leaves He leaves everyone, you know, three guys, three servants, sets of minas. Um, one guy just puts in a handkerchief and he's in trouble. Uh, the others two um, put it to work well and are rewarded cities. The big question is when the king comes back, what does that refer to in real life? Most commentators will say that refers to the parousia or the second coming, and I disagree with that. I think that Jesus actually, because in the very, uh, you know, very next, the next chapter, what, but Jesus comes to Jerusalem to shouts of Hosanna. He's being crowned the king, essentially the triumphal entry. So when he comes back, he is already king and the, and the, the kingship. I mean, it's an unfolding kingship. And he, he and he goes through this process of coronation, even through the crucifixion um, and into the ascension. And then he begins to rule. Um, but j that that parable is talking about Jesus as the king who is hated by certain of his subjects. And um, he's already coming back to execute judgment in the present. And he does it uh, in part through the cross. And in Luke 21, um, uh, well, in, in Luke 19, where Jesus is talking about, okay, well, you know, uh, two will be in a bed, one will be taken away, the other will be left behind, and two women, you know, grinding meal. Um, those, for me, those are images right from the Exodus story, where, uh, you know, um, it's when it says two in a bed, it's the two are two males. Um, they're not married couples, like we're kind of quick to to it on that. Um, and that refers back to the the 10th plague where the firstborn male, you know, you know, if, if they didn't have the, the blood on the mantle um, and with the women, uh, you know, grinding meal, that's 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 also referred to in the Exodus. So he's framing that within the sense of the 10 plagues. I think when when does that play out? I don't see any rapture here. What I do see is the uh, destruction of the Jerusalem and how that would be a kind of sorting process. Uh, in Luke 21, I, I, I think the passage is predominantly about the destruction of the Jerusalem. Um, but toward the end, you've got about three or four verses that talk about the parousia. So when the Son of Man comes with the clouds, when is that? I believe that's fulfilled in 70 AD. Um, but, but... I think it also, in some sense, looks ahead to the renewal of the heavens and the earth. And that is because if the temple was understood by Judaism as a microcosm of the cosmos, then doesn't it make sense that this is actually a kind of foretaste of what's going to happen at the Perusia? So to put it another way, the destruction of the temple was a, an event of massive significance uh, for Judaism. And... Um, was a kind of dress rehearsal for the transformation of the cosmos when Jesus returns um, to rule. Okay, so, so just to clarify, though, so yeah. it talks about Jesus coming in a cloud, and that's so he's coming in judgment at the destruction of Jerusalem. Is Correct. that what you're referring to? That's right. Okay, and we don't want to confuse that with the second coming, though it has some relationship that's that's my take on it. i mean it's right at daniel 7. it's the son of man coming with the clouds what's what's happening in daniel 7 is the son of man is dealing out judgment on the nations um and that's that's what is going on with the the, the sack of jerusalem uh yes and judaism is part of the nations right and that's what nt Wright says too and i, I think that view is getting a lot more scholars are going with that but it's still controversial yeah, that's right. And uh, RT France goes that way too, but I'm, I'm with right in France. Okay, interesting. All righty, so um, from Gethsemane to the crucifixion, 
Jesus' suffering, his arrest, his interrogation, his torture. So, um, what is Luke doing with all this? How does he see this fitting in? Yeah, um, boy, that's a good question. If if you were to kind of line it up against the other Gospels, and this is, this is a little bit hard right now for me because I'm finishing up a commentary on John for Zondervan, and, and they can blur together. I think <laughs> here's, here's one thing that... Um, is going on is there's attention to Herod um, more so than the other gospels. And Luke seems particularly interested in Herod, especially that bit in Luke seven, when he's talking about John the Baptist in one moment and by talking about Herod, he says, uh, you know, when you went out to the desert, what did you see? Um, did you see a, 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 an effeminate man, you know, dressed in garments? Did you see a reed swaying in the wind? And, and we know from, preserved coinage that the reed was Herod's symbol. So he's he's contrasting the integrity of John the Baptist with the not so <laughs> integrous uh, Herod. And Herod comes, you know, shows up and um, spends a lot of time with Jesus. So that's a particularly inter uh, interesting point of interest for Luke. I'm not sure what to do with that theologically. I will say theologically that Luke seems more interested than at least Matthew and Mark in bringing Jesus out as the suffering servant. There's more allusions, I think, to the uh, to Isaiah 52, 53 um, going on there, uh, sh showing that uh, he is the one. For example, um, you, you know, when Jesus is, is beaten and interrogated, he made no answer. And, um, you know, that's right out of the verse from Isaiah. But other than that, I can't think of anything that really is saliently unique, and maybe I just haven't thought about it enough. All right, and then um, with the resurrection and ascension, um, we don't see the ascension showing up right. um, other places. So this is uh, very significant. And if you could tie it in, okay, this is not about the book of Acts, but we have Pentecost coming up. Right. Um, so how are those events, resurrection, ascension, Pentecost? Tied yeah, in? so, I mean, there's something deeply structural about it because Luke's story begins at the temple with an angel in Jerusalem. Luke, Luke's gospel ends with Jesus outside of Jerusalem raising his hands like a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And then he, he ascends. And then the spirit comes down in early, early part of the book of Acts. And then there's an outward motion. So <clears throat> Luke encapsulates this whole gospel within temple. Let's put it that way. As right, because it mentions that they're in the temple right, praising God at the right. very end, like so the last Luke, verse. Exactly, right. So the last verse is, there. where do they go to the temple? So he leads them out of the temple, outside Jerusalem, and uh, pronounces a blessing on them, and in that sense, power uh, to go fulfill their mission now. And and then after that, the Holy Spirit comes in the book of Acts, so they, you know, they, eventually they go outward, and there's a, a movement toward Rome and beyond. Um so what that says, at least to me, is Luke has purposely structured his gospel in such a way where he wants to say that whole Jesus story redefines what temple is. The temple is now based in the person of Jesus. Okay, perfect setup for book of Acts. Jesus, um, Jesus is ascended, um, and he's going to exercise his role as king and high priest from the heavens by sending the Holy Spirit. And many of the th things that Jesus did are then recapitulated through the church. Um, and Luke promises that in the opening verses of Acts. All right, all right. So um, finally, um, the Gospel of Luke, as far as an application for the life and mission of the church today, what would be some key points? Yeah, boy, there's so much you could say. I'd, I'd, I might break it down to three or four points. Number one, I would say going back to um, the issue of story and narrative, controlling narratives, a, a really important theme for Luke is salvation. And um, 
I think when when we think about contemporary discussions of politics, one way to frame that discussion is what is the source of our salvation? Um, what's going to get us to where we need to be as a society and how do people need to act? Rome said we, you know, Caesar is the source of salvation and the whole political system that Caesar controls. It was a political religious system. A, Judaism said the same thing. You know, we are the theocracy. We've got the right system. And Luke rejects both of those and says, no, the theocracy is to be found in Jesus. Salvation is to be found in Jesus. I think um, Christians today, at least Western Christians, have very split thinking in terms of they have a they have a silo for their religion. And then the real life and politics is somehow strangely disconnected from all that, except to say, hey, we need to act like Jesus acted. OK. That, that's just not helpful at all, um, because there's so much more you have to think about. So I think what Luke does is challenges us to think much more deeply about the gospel narratives driving our lives. And, um, and frankly, how for many, many Christians, how deeply secular they are. Uh, and in that sense, unbiblical. Um, number two, hospitality. Um, you know, it's just sad how little uh, Christians practice hospitality. And I, I know that it's a thing just not to have people in your home. Um, but this is an opportunity for Christians to be truly countercultural by saying, you know what, I'm not just going to meet you at the restaurant or the coffee shop to be your friend. I'm actually going to bring you in my home and we're going to hang out and I'm going to be lavish with my time. And are there risks with that? Yes. And, you know, and then bringing people in who you normally wouldn't think first about bringing in. I mean, you know, Jesus says next time you have a lunch or dinner, rather than the first person that comes to mind what's the last person to come to mind and then invite that person uh, i'd love to see more of that um and maybe you know my wife and i need to do more of that but i think that's that's a challenge uh as well i think the other th theme that's really important for luke is just to focus on the marginalized the women the children the blind the lame the crippled every society has its has its demographic pockets who are co considered outsiders and we just, you know, we need to keep coming back to saying, you know, Jesus said, privilege those groups when it comes to the gospel. Um, and in terms of who the church really needs to focus on, in terms of our attitudes uh, to non-majority groupings, um, let's start there. And rather than starting with, like, who's going to be the most powerful and, and who do we want to impress? And I think the church needs to stop trying to impress people, stop trying to fit into a certain political mold um, or a stop trying to impress its culture despisers. Uh, that is a dead end and it's going to lead us into trouble. Uh, instead, let's just get about the business about people who desperately uh, need to be enfranchised um, and fold them and share the gospel in the process. All right. A lot of good words there. All righty. Well, I'm Dennis Metzler. You've been listening to The Charge. We've been with Dr. Nicholas Perrin, who is the president of Trinity International University and the author of the volume Luke in the Tyndale New Testament commentary series. And so you're also coming out with a volume on John for a Zondervan series? Right. God Story series. All righty. All right. And when will that be out? Oh, hopefully within about eight months. All right. Good, good. Okay, so just follow the link below for the, the loot commentary. So, uh, Dr. Perrin, thanks so much for joining us today. Dennis, thanks for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. All right. Peace to everyone. Okay. Bye now.